We have a very exciting first session to start today. Uh, we'll have um, Guy first talk about multi group perspective on fairness, and later on, Michael will build on this topic on another paper. Okay, great. So thanks uh, for inviting me to speak, and uh, I'll do my best to be a suitable warm-up act for Michael's talk, which uh, will delve a little bit uh, deeper into recent work. Um, so I want to sort of give a perspective. I'll talk mostly about one work from the past, but also hopefully a broader perspective about this multi-group uh, fairness. And the talk is based on joint works with uh, Cynthia Dwork, Ursula Herbert Johnson, Michael Kim, Omer Reingold, and Gal Yona. And many thanks to my collaborators there we go. Uh, for slides, especially, I'm really uh, ruthlessly taking advantage of Omer's uh, slides in this talk. So if you see something you like, it's probably due to Omer, and the things you don't like are probably my uh, modifications. So we know from uh, this cluster and um, from, <laughs> work from the first day of the workshop yesterday, that algorithms are making um, and informing really important uh, decisions. And I think what's remarkable about this is both the scope of the decisions uh, that are being made by algorithms or informed by algorithms and the scale at which this is happening, which are, I think, unprecedented and only going to grow. And you know there are many advantages to this, but there are also concerns. And the concern for the talk today, and I guess for this whole program, is uh, discrimination. Okay, so what happens to protected minorities when the decisions are being made by algorithms and by machine learning, in particular? And it's not a new question. Um, the study of fairness is old and multidisciplinary, um, spanning lots of fields. Um, the challenge of algorithmic decision making and the scope and the scale that I just talked about are new. And so fairness is, I think, attracting explosive interest within computer science. And in particular, I want to talk about, or the perspective I want to bring is a perspective from theoretical computer science, where there's also growing interest. And I think naively, maybe at some point in the past that none of us remember now, there was some hope that if the algorithms are making the decisions, they can make more equitable decisions. As we heard yesterday, and as we all know now, there's a lot of suspicion there's mostly suspicion, I think, about algorithms making decisions in fairness. And I actually want to, I think the suspicion is uh, merited and important. But uh, I do think that by bringing the tools of computer science and of theoretical computer science and cryptography to bear on this problem, maybe we can um, at least have some ideas or some perspectives on how to really make algorithms make equitable decisions. So maybe there's also some room for optimism or certainly room for an ambitious research agenda. So thinking about this from a theoretical perspective, what would I want as a theoretician? I would want this you know, very beautiful um, holy grail that you have here at the bottom. <laughs> so what I would want is to formulate an all-encompassing, general purpose, mathematical definition of fairness that's foolproof and handles every concern that we, you know, under the sun. That's what I would want. Maybe we'll get there, maybe not. We haven't gotten there yet, and I think we haven't gotten there for good reasons. Uh, fairness is difficult. It's um, very context dependent. It you know, incorporates social norms. Um, and discrimination can be very subtle. So, so there's a catalog of evils as um, um, depicted in, uh, in the phrase is from a work of Dwork et al. Uh, discrimination can be very subtle. It's hard to detect, hard to reason about. Um, it's a hard problem. So you know, we could give up um, and not work on it at all. I think that my background is that it's in cryptography. What would a cryptographer do? We can take this very big problem you know, that is very context dependent and varies a lot in different settings. We don't need to tackle all of it at once. I think we can have a very rich and successful research program by identifying and formalizing particular concerns about discrimination. So you know, we say that it's very context dependent. There are very different types of discrimination. There are lots of concerns. Let's start cataloging them. Let's identify them. Let's formalize them and come up with countermeasures that might not be all encompassing, but they might handle serious concerns, serious particular concerns. And maybe in the end, we'll actually get to this holy grail. Even if we don't, this is still a valuable research program. So that's certainly the perspective for the talk today. Also, cryptographers, you know, with all that, I mean, with all due respect, uh, did not have much success get, uh, exporting it to, to application till maybe recently. So, I mean, you're not doing the 
<laughs> so first of all, you know, from my uh, donning my theoretician hat, um, if we can have, if we can start, I think starting by having a mathematical theory that we think really tackles these problems is a big first step. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about the transition. Yeah. And I think also cryptography, you know, encryption had an impact early, right? So. Yeah, some, some. We can argue about it. <laughs> let's argue about it uh, over coffee. Or let's argue over it uh, during Michael's talk. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit today about so setting up the problem. In particular, I want to talk about automated prediction or risk scores. Um, going talk a little bit about uh, group fairness. That's, that'll be my straw man. And then going beyond it and talking about our complexity theoretic perspective um, and in particular instantiation of a broader perspective in this new notion of multi-calibration. I'll spend most of the talk on that. And then if I have time, I'm going to revi revisit individual fairness. And in particular, I'm not going to do individual fairness, but I'm going to re revisit metric-based fairness notions. And um, that's all you know, the sort of boring, tedious part. And then the second act uh, in the double feature will be Michael Kim on evidence-based rankings. So the setting for both talks is that of prediction. So we want to know, predict the probabilities uh, of events for certain individuals. So we have this individual, we want to predict maybe the probability that they'll click on an ad or an article. That's one uh, maybe, I mean, we heard yesterday about the stakes for ads, but maybe a low, low stake uh, or low impact uh, prediction. Higher impact predictions for medical or insurance purposes, what's the probability that this person will have a heart attack or another serious medical event? What's the probability that a person will repay a loan? That's sort of what we want to do. We want to learn to predict prob individual probabilities. Um, and the way we want to do it is by learning from historical outcomes. So this, the model I want to have in mind for this is that every individual, um, we have every individual is represented by a set of features. And so every individual has a set of features x. And the way I want to think about it is that every individual has an innate individual probability. Probability here is a loaded word, and I'll talk about that. But every individual has a probability of success, uh, p star, so the probability that the individual will repay the loan, the probability that maybe the individual will succeed in college. Um, success, I mean, it could be the probability of having a heart attack, but there are these innate probabilities for the individual x. And if the innate probability is 0 0.8, what we actually get to observe in the end, we don't know what the innate probability is, we get to observe the outcome. A 0, 1 outcome, did the individual succeed or did they not? That's just a Bernoulli random variable, gets value 1 with probability p star of x. So these are the outcomes that we see. And what we want to do is to learn to predict the actual probabilities. So we never get to see these probabilities, these innate probabilities p star, and still we want to learn to predict them. This, um, so we observe for individuals outcomes y. Maybe this individual succeeded in college, another individual didn't. And given a data set of such historical outcomes, we want to learn to predict p star. And the caveat. Um, when I talk about individual probabilities, you should all you know, stand up screaming and tell me, you know, what's the probability over? Where are these probabilities coming from? What do you mean? And that's a really good question. Um, you know, where is the randomness coming from? Is this, am I talking about randomness in the universe? Am I talking about randomness that's sort of, am I just talking about the limitations of the data features that I have? And individual probabilities are a contentious topic in statistics and economics going back decades. I don't want to open up that can of worms. Um, that's of course me to, but let's not. We won't resolve that here. One thing I do want to say is that this is happening all over the place. Right. There are many machine learning systems at scales of hundreds of millions or billions of users that are trying to predict individual probabilities being used every day. And this is our attempt. We're going to attempt to talk about fairness in that context. So, Kai, just in terms of notation, when you write P star X, do you mean that the P star is a or? Yes. I'm thinking about the P star. Every individual has a set of, uh, so <laughs> every individual I think of as being unique. So every individual, say the set of features is unique to the individual. It includes your um, unique identifier. And P star X is that particular individual's probability of success. And, and you can think of it once it's a sign. the information that you need for predicting for, for determining success. X is not a random identifier that was uniquely assigned to somebody at birth. 
X is not a random identifier that was uniquely assigned to somebody at birth. It's got the information that you need. Once it's unique, you know, you can map a function and say, you know, there exists a function that maps X. Hmm? You want it to join? Yeah. So is there, is there any way of measuring ground truth? What is the meaning of this P of X? Very good question, and there's no way, given a P of X, you know, there, and there's a literature saying it's impossible to distinguish um, the true, it might be impossible to distinguish, to distinguish the true P star from some P star that's being given that, that's not the true one, and this is one of the reasons why this is a contentious topic. So how do you define your loss? So I haven't defined loss at all, and I actually won't be interested in loss because I want to talk about fairness, not about accuracy. So could P star be interpreted as some noise in the features that are observable, which is inherently there because we can't observe every feature exactly? You can interpret it that way. Right. And, and so P star could be sort of, uh, in, in some epsilon neighborhood, there are actually that many fraction of people who actually get the decision or not. Could, could that be P star? So I'd want to take it offline okay. because we could talk for 45 minutes or an hour and a half or for a three-day workshop, we could talk about P-STAR, and I don't want to. Or 30 years. Or 30 years. People have been studying these questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so our goal is we're given a data set of historical information, you know, individuals, each their features, and their outcome, a 0-1 outcome. And what we want to do is learn a predictor P. Okay, we want to predict the probability that individuals will repay their loan to decide whether to give them a loan or not. That's sort of the framework we're in. And the thing I want to talk about, so I don't want to talk about accuracy, the thing I'm really concerned with right now is fairness. Okay, once we have these predictors, what does it mean for a predictor to be fair? What are the concerns we might have? And when we're doing machine learning on this kind of historical data, there's biases everywhere. I like this quote that machine learning is money laundering for bias. You can sort of take your bias, you know, bake it into a predictor and say, this is the predictor, and you've laundered away your bias, supposedly, but it's still there. So there's biases, biases through the machine learning pipeline. There's bias in the data. There might be bias in the historical data. What I want to talk about today is that there might be further bias, even if the data itself, the historical outcome data, is unbiased, which it isn't. There might be further biased biases introduced in the data analysis and the algorithm that's doing the machine learning itself. This can be either malicious or inadvertent. So for example, if we have some protected minority or protected group S that on average are more likely to default than the general population in this fair data set, the machine learning may just completely give up on S, make the problem much worse because the machine learning is constrained, right? We want to output some predictor that has a constrained complexity, and maybe the machine learning algorithm will just decide to give up on S entirely, um, including the qualified members, so making the problem much worse. So biases, and we could talk about many other sources of bias through the machine learning pipeline. This is going to be an important one for the talk today. So how do we reason about the fairness um, of a predictor? So one way, which um, I'm going to argue is naive, is this idea of group notions of fairness where the, kind of the formalization or what we would want is to say that in aggregate, we, we have a protected group S, and we want the predictor in aggregate to behave similarly on the protected group to the general population. And in aggregate here is very important. Um, similarly could mean different things, so there are different notions. Statistical parity says that the outcomes, maybe the, so the average prediction on S and U is the same or um, for every possible outcome, it's equally likely on S and in the general population. And we could talk about similar false positive or false negative rates. We could talk about calibration, which is a notion of accuracy that I'll talk about more in the talk today. So various interpretations of what it means to behave similarly, and each of them would give us a group, no, a group sort of aggregate notion of fairness. So certainly, I think this can sometimes, it can, this can, it can make sense to check whether statistical parity or balance or calibration hold, given your predictor. And you know, it might be a red flag for your particular setting if statistical parity doesn't hold. But the fact that statistical parity holds only gives you a very weak guarantee. That's what I want to argue. So taken as fairness definitions, these are very weak and easy to abuse. Moreover, they're at odds with each other, um, um, as shown by uh, Cholkova and by Kleinberg and Mul 
Kleinberg and Mulinathan, am I missing? Yeah, no, Ragavan. Ragavan. Oh, Ragavan, Mulinathan and Ragavan, thank you. Um, and another question is which group S are we trying to protect? What do we, I mean, who are the protected group? And I want to say this is a critical question. Okay. So the point is even if I want to protect, even if what I want to do is protect a group notion, um, and I, as long as I'm, and I know the group, I, you know, I know a particular minority that, or a particular protected group that I want to ensure fairness for, <laughs> I might not be protecting important subgroups. So the beautiful example from the work of Dwork et al. is the example of a steakhouse. Okay, that's uh, trying to advertise, uh, trying to avoid, adver to avoid having customers from the group S. Um, and you know, maybe they want, maybe you know, for, legal purposes um, or just for public relations, they want to show that they advertise at the same rate to the general population and to members of S. So you know, they want to satisfy statistical parity and they can do this by advertising to vegetarians in S and to meat eaters in the general population, or to meat eaters outside of S. So statistical parity is satisfied. Maybe they advertise to 1% in both groups, but clearly they're advertising to the people that are never gonna show up in the steakhouse. So this has never occurred to me before until exactly this time, although I've heard this example many times. How much of this does it has to do with the fact that like, so statistical parity would allow this, but like equalized odds would. You can, for no. all of them, for any of these. Right, I agree, but this one in particular. I think this one in particular would be problematic okay. for equalized odds. Uh, or, I mean, you know, this, this wouldn't pass. Right. Uh, yeah. Among those pass who are qualified to eat steak, yeah. you would get the same. <laughs> 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 yeah. so it depends but on then what if you tell me that your fairness notion is equalized odds, I'll come up with a different yeah, example that totally purpose. abuses yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, that was just one that So, I, I mean, similarly, uh, there's a piece of this example that's always bothered me, which is that um, you're assuming here that you can't actually measure who shows up at the restaurant. As soon as you do that, then these statistical notions will show that you have an experiment. I agree. But what I want to say is that for any notion that you come up with, like I, and I'll take it offline, but we'll, we can play this game during the break and maybe I'll need help from the audience. But for any proposed group notion, or I mean, maybe you can propose one, a new one, and you know, I'll, be, I'll be forced to take it back. But my statement is that for any group notion uh, that you try to throw at me, or at us as an audience, we'll be able to come up with an example that um, is blatantly unfair, even though it satisfies that notion. That's been my experience. I guess the, the piece that I'm, I'm trying to push you on is I'd like to understand more about what the model is that you're using and where it allows measuring, right? Because in order for this example to hold, you're clearly not allowing measuring of the people who show up at the restaurant. Right. And so, that, so then there's sort of an underlying model that I want to try to understand more that you seem to be assuming. So, you know, my claim is that here the concern, here you're right that my um, concern that's not being handled is who is and isn't showing up at the steakhouse. And then you're saying, well, let's measure that and then let's sort of let's legislate that the steakhouse has to have equal representation for all groups. And I think that's a fine suggestion. We could talk about more subtle concerns then for sort of, um, you know, for example, for hiring. And again, okay, you might leave me out, but there's this issue of like a self-fulfilling prophecy that um, companies interview um, token candidates from protected groups, but they select the ones that aren't going to pass the interview. And so they say, oh, we actually, you know, looking at measuring who shows up for the interview, the appropriate people are showing up for the interview. Um, you know, they're just not qualified, and so they weren't hired. Um, and then you could say, well, let's measure who actually gets hired. We can measure who actually gets hired, and you know, this could be a game that we could play till infinity. I agree with you that if what we want to guarantee is that the thing we're measuring is equal across groups, then we can guarantee it. But uh, the moment you know we go beyond that, if we want to guarantee something more than that, then we can come up with more subtle, like you know, maybe you're hiring them, but you're not promoting them. Maybe you're hiring them into certain roles and not into others. So things get complicated very quickly. And also, maybe you're hiring, I don't know, let's talk about a protected group, and then you know maybe, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Maybe um, you're hiring appropriately within the protected group, but you're not hiring within a subgroup, say a gender subgroup within that group. And we would worry about that as well. Just your claim that uh, any group notion can have some counterexample. 
Um, I guess the things you listed off all feel like notions of being able to s distinguish the output of a protected, the output on a protected group versus the output on a, a population group. Um, could you just generalize that and say any computationally bounded distinguisher trying to like would you that wouldn't have a counterexample, right? Like in cryptography, right? You have all these different tests of pseudo randomness. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I'm going to suggest taking it offline. Okay. okay. Um, so I think the point in the steakhouse ad, and the point I want to make, you know, even if we were protecting within S, maybe there's an uh, intersection of S with some other protected attribute like gender that we want to protect. So for fairness, it's really important to identify the relevant subgroups. Okay, so a relevant subgroup here was the carnivores in S. Maybe that wasn't, you know, that's a, that can be a difficult task. Actually thinking through who the relevant subgroups are can be very challenging. Similarly, we want to make sure that the qualified loan applicants, whatever that means, are getting similar treatment if we're, uh, if we're giving out loans. So figuring out who the relevant subgroup is is a difficult task. In our perspective, which was also so taken in, um, in beautiful work of Kieran's, um, Neil, Roth, and Wu, is to protect every set that can be identified, and maybe this is going a little bit towards your question, Manuel, every set that can be identified from the data within given computational limitations within a given complexity class. For example, um, going back to Manuel's suggestion, maybe every group that can be identified, say, with polynomial size circuits, that would be a very strong level of protection. So our perspective is, uh, is that we don't necessarily know who the relevant subgroups are. That can be a difficult task. And so just try to protect all of them, or at least all, the, all of them is difficult. Um, ask me a question, I'll tell you why but certainly try to protect everyone that can be identified by a reasonably complex uh, class, computational class. Is, isn't that contradictory? Because if I'm conducting a computation, then the outcome of my computation is something that I can identify with computational, and then I'm biased because I accepted everybody in this group and nobody outside this group. So what I mean is that the protection we want you know, maybe it's some sort of statistical parity. Maybe it's some level of some notion of accuracy, like calibration, we'll get to, which I'll get to in a moment. That should hold. That property should hold for every group that I can identify efficiently. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to accept all the people in every group that I can identify. But the fairness notion that I'm after should hold for every group that's identified. If you have the intuition perfect, is if you have perfect uh, prediction. You do have to, you do have to be slightly improper, right? You have to move slightly outside the box. So the thing I want to do now for most of the talk is talk about um, a particular instantiation of this perspective um, for this notion of um, multi calibration. Um, where then what we'll want to guarantee is calibration, which is a notion of accuracy that I'll get to in a minute for every subset in a rich family C. Okay, so for every subset, and think about this family C as some sort of computational class. Okay, so maybe it's every subset that can be identified. By identified, I mean there's sort of a circuit in the class or a computational object in the class that can decide whether X is in the subset or not, whether an individual X is in the subset or not. So every subset that can be identified, say, by circuits of a certain size, by conjunctions um, of a certain number of attributes, by a decision list, Whatever computational class you want to consider, what we'll try to do is guarantee calibration or a different notion for every subset um, in that class simultaneously. And notice here that I'm not talking about one group or two groups or five groups. This could be an exponential number of groups, will be an exponential number of groups that's being protected. So in particular, if the carnivores can be identified within the family C, we can uh, guarantee statistical parity, or in this case, we'll talk about calibration for them. Um, if the qualified loan applicants can be identified by four-way conjunctions, um, then we'll guarantee calibration. And that's really the intuition is we want to make sure that the qualified candidates um, are not being passed over or are not being ignored, um, are not being ignored within, a, within any protected group. So, What's this notion of calibration or what's the notion I want? So 
before doing that, a nice warm up notion is multi, what we call multi accuracy, where what we would want is that in aggregate, for every group in C, so for every one of these exponential number of groups, the expectation, the aggregate expectation of the predictor we output is about equal to the aggregate expectation of the correct P star. That's one notion of accuracy that we could want to guarantee for all the groups. Notice that. The fact that the expectation is correct in aggregate doesn't say anything, and that's going back to your question, it doesn't say that for individuals we have accuracy. But in aggregate over the group, for every single group in my class, I want to have an accurate expectation. And calibration just takes this one step further and actually says that for every group, if I look at the people within that group who got prediction v, v is a value between 0 and 1, really about v of them should have output 1, or really the expectation, the true, um, expectation of P star for those people should be about V. Okay, so for all the people who got prediction V within the group, about V of them, a V fraction of them, should get label 1. Whatever the data. So that's multi-calibration. And this is really, um, going back to the concerns I talked about before, this is a notion of fairness that's really rooted in accuracy. We're trying to get a certain notion of accuracy. And of course, if the data is biased, that bias might be perpetuated. It's not going to protect us um, from the biased data. Still, I think that it can protect, can protect us from further evils, so for, from the algorithm, the machine learning itself, um, introducing further biases. And also, both in this talk and in Michael's talk, we'll, we'll see how once we have this notion, even if the data were biased, we can start talking about corrective discrimination and undoing the biases. But before we talk about doing the biases, we need to have something that's really accurate for all the groups. So it can also be a stepping stone towards that. An example you can think about, uh, which in, is nice, I think this is um, Emmer's example, um, is ageism in healthcare. So we have diseases that are un underdiagnosed in elderly patients or other populations because they can be masked as age-related symptoms. So if we're training a machine learning, if we're using machine learning and its complexity is constrained, it might choose to optimize on younger patients. It's going to get more bang for its buck by really understanding the young patient population really well, and it might underserve or misdiagnose the elderly patients. Now we, here we don't want statistical parity. We don't want, um, we certainly don't want statistical parity. We don't want to overcorrect because really often maybe it is age-related symptoms. Um, that are coming up and not an underlying disease. And we don't want to always, you know, to always say, always conduct tests and treatment that might be harmful. So really what we want, or what we want as a first step, would be something like calibration or a notion of accuracy saying that we can't just ignore the elderly population. We also want to diagnose the sick within the elderly population accurately. Um, so related works, I think the most related one is this work I talk about of Kieran's and all. Um, who take a similar perspective. They focus on uh, notions like statistical parity and balance, whereas we focus on calibration. Um, there have been a few works now taking this perspective or building on this perspective. Um, one that I want to point out is this work on multi-accuracy uh, by Kim, uh, Gorbani, and Zhu. Um, and they do, they, they work with multi-accuracy, so not multi-calibration, but the weaker notion or the slightly more relaxed notion. And they actually do some experiments. They have encouraging experimental result uh, using a new algorithm that guarantees multi-accuracy. Um, and they also show how to use that algorithm to correct biased data using very few good samples. So maybe we have a large data set of biased examples, but we have a few unbiased examples, and we can use those few to correct, um, to both learn from the larger biased data set, but also correct it. And that's another place where, even though we're talking about um, accuracy-based notions, um, they can actually help even when your data is biased. So the flavor of results we have with multi-calibration, uh, first you might ask, you know, is it even possible, maybe this is too strong a definition, and it just can't ever be achieved, or it can only rarely be achieved. And we show actually that there always exists a multi-calibrated predictor, and in fact it's not much, it's not some monstrous complicated beast, it's about as efficient, a little bit less efficient than just membership checking for tests, for sets within the class we're, being, we're considering. Okay, so this isn't science fiction. Actually, small and efficient multi-calibrated predictors do exist once we specify our class. One question is, can we find them? 
So we have an algorithm um, that learns from just labeled data sets, so it learns from outcomes. Its complexity is linear in the size of the class and the number of sets we're protecting. Of course, I said that can be exponential, and so linear in the size of C might not be good enough for us. If we're talking about 10-way conjunctions, maybe it's feasible. If we're talking about all circuits of size S, then probably it's not feasible. And we show that this is inherent. There's a type relationship between multi-calibration and a type of weak agnostic learning. This is bad news um, if you think that weak agnostic, if you think that agnostic, if, well, you know, keeping in mind that we know that agnostic learning is often hard in the worst case, but it can, maybe it can be good news, good news because um, we know that in practice, agnostic learning tasks are solved all the time. So linear in the size of C, I mean, like if we look at learning, the, the, the real parameter is the visit dimension of C, which could be uh, better. So is it really the size that gives you the load bound or, or the visit dimension or something like that? For the running time, it's the size that gives us the lower bound. For the sample complexity, I believe it can be the VC dimension, but I don't think we, uh, we didn't prove that, did we? I don't think it's in the paper, but so I this think is a lower bound, not... Uh, no, no, it's an upper bound, bound and a lower bound. It's not agnostic yeah. learning. Okay. So. Yeah. so the upper bound, really what the algorithm is doing is enumerating over the class C. The lower bound is for proper learning or for... Mm -hmm. No, there's no notion of proper or improper here. We're not assuming anything about P star, so we don't know anything about it. And, you know, we're not. Again, it's going back to the point that I'm not trying to guarantee accurate, you know, the actual error, L1 or L2 error. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that we can also impose this multi-calibration through post-processing. It'll only improve your error. Um, I think we won't really have time to get much into that. So, okay, so... I'm going, I want to be ambitious, and I want to actually show you this algorithm. And it's not so ambitious because I can fit the algorithm on a single slide. So before showing you the algorithm, just see, understand exactly what our task is. So we're given a sample of training data, okay, Xi's and Yi's, and we know the class C that we want to protect. The goal is to learn a predictor that's multi-calibrated on C. There's this alpha slackness parameter um, in the definition of multi-calibration. For multi-accuracy, these expectations I said were about equal. The expectation of P star and of the predictor P were about equal. They're equal up to an alpha factor. And so that's sort of the, the smaller alpha is, the better the guarantee, but the more complicated, the more data we'll need and the more complicated the algorithm will be. And the key issue is uh, we don't want to just be multi-calibrated or multi-accurate on the training sample. We want to generalize outside it. So whatever distribution these Xi's are coming for, from we want to generalize to that distribution. We're not assuming anything about P star. Okay, so we're not in any sort of realizable setting. Um, the naive thing, we'll just look at all the intersections of all the groups. Naively, we're not going to get very far. Actually, what we show is that you can learn this predictor. The overhead is polynomial in 1 over alpha, so this slackness guarantee. Um, and the running time, we said, is linear in the number of sets being protected and polynomial in 1 over alpha. So how does this algorithm actually work? Ooh, the animations got lost. We're just going to see all of it. We're cutting through the okay, So that's the algorithm in a box. Um, the, the way we start is, at first, we know nothing. So we're just going to initialize our predictor to say a half for everyone. We're going to predict a half for everyone. And then the algorithm just repeatedly looks for a set where calibration is violated. Okay, so you know, if this predictor is already good, great, we're done. Probably it won't be. So we're going to enumerate over all the sets in the class C and over all the possible predictions. And we're going to try to find a category within a set, a set T that's supposed to be protected, and a prediction V where calibration is violated. And there's some discretization issues here that I'm brushing aside. Um, we're looking for a set where calibration is uh, violated. Once we find the set, all we're going to do is correct our predictors, um, correct the, the expectation of our predictor on that set. Okay, so right now, the predictor is saying V for everyone in the set. That's the expectation of the predictor. Calibration is violated. So P star is not saying V for that set. It's saying something far away from V. So we just want to correct. And we're going to move everyone's predictions within the set. We're going to move them in the direction of the, of, um, in the, direction of the true values. So okay, you so assume you have access to P star? Ah, very good question. So the question is, 
okay, so that's an algorithm, but immediately uh, you're uh, trying to brush this under the rug, but you won't let me. So of course, I don't know P star. We don't know it, and you know, I had this whole long spiel about the fact that we want to learn from outcomes, not from P star, but we can estimate this expectation very well. This is an expectation of P star, so we can estimate it very well from label data. And wait a slide if you still have a question about that, and I hope it will be answered in the next slide. Uh, so is it possible to replace the enumeration step over C by some optimization oracle over C? Yes. Like, so we do, in fact, have such a reduction saying that if you have some sort of an agnostic learning oracle from C, then you can actually do this step efficiently. That's why sort of that's one direction of the equivalence to agnostic learning. I see. And that out, given such oracle, you would not pay for the linear runtime. Yes. Okay. Yes. And as a heuristic, maybe you could just run your favorite machine learning algorithm and see what happens here. And maybe it'll maybe it'll find you such a set. It's oracle efficient. So you're you're just not worrying about like finite sample variability here, basically, right? Um, we do. We do. So what do you mean? Like where you estimate p star, you're just going to take the fraction of that subgroup with the. With the so I have this alpha slackness that I'm going for, and I need my sample to be large enough. So at least sort of one over alpha squared to know that the empirical oh. expectation within my sample is very close to the true underlying expectation. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so is it required that you start from everything being one half or? No, and that's a great question. And when I talked before about running this, about imposing multi-calibration as post-processing, you could start with whatever you want, kind of your favorite predictor. And you could run the algorithm starting with that, and it would still converge. And have you seen empirically whether it tends to lead to different accuracy, like to different final accuracy rates if you start at an accurate predictor, for example? I'm sure it will lead to. The, I'm sure it will lead. To, yeah. Do. Yeah. So Michael says yes. One more question. Promise to stop. If you if you calibrate on every single ton, then you're calibrated all over. Right. So why depend on the size of C? It is just because C could be exponential in the number of singletons. Mm -hmm. Just work over singletons and you're done. So <laughs> if I could work on the singletons, then I would, but that requires a du that actually requires a doubly exponential family. So it won't work. Um, so there are two problems with singletons. First, I can't estimate this unless the group has large fractional mass within the distribution, so my algorithm will fail. But also sort of um, conceptually, if you want to, well, no, that's the issue. So, so, and again, I want to really stress that this all works. We don't need to reason about the kind of accuracy you need to achieve, so we can work in a totally agnostic setting. And you can still guarantee this notion of fairness. And that's important. So we really wanted to, we want to handle the situation where we can't avoid making errors. We can't really recover the correct P star, and still we want to reason about fairness. And we can, and that's sort of important. Do you know if you really need the groups to have like bounded complexity as opposed to just the groups not being too small? Like I think it, it, in the setting that, that we thought about for false positive rates, like we eventually figured out that like actually we didn't need bounded PC dimension for the groups, we just needed them to not be too small. And I wonder if the same is true. I think we do, because you're always going to have, um, you know, if your algorithm in the end the predictor is not perfect and it makes errors, then you can always define the group on which it's making errors in one way or another. And you're going to be very bad on that group. So I think it's true. I think it's important to have a priori bounded set of groups. Oh, uh, can sorry. You, can you actually, can, could you repeat your question? Yes, yeah, so, so, so I mean, um, what we figured out in our setting where we were thinking about false positive rates is you do need bounded VC dimension for the class of functions mm -hmm. so if you're learning over. Right. But for the class of groups you want to protect, it turned out, I think you only need that you know, none of them are too small. But you guys include circuits for determining whether somebody is in a group as part of the classifier. Yeah, so I don't know so what the... so. Complex. We're not assuming anything about, I think there are two classes here. There's the class that you're sort of, if you want to assume P star is coming from some class, and then there's the class of groups we're talking about. And we're not assuming that P star is coming from any class. We're not bounding it at all. And when you do that, then you do have to bound the complexity of the groups. I think that if we were assuming that P star was coming from some class, then we would be able to avoid it, but we didn't go there and we didn't want to do that. 
I'm still a little confused, so I don't know if I answered. Uh, I think I'll think about it. Take it all. Yeah, yeah. Let's take it offline. Um, okay. The one uh, subtlety that I'm glossing over here is, you know, I told you that well, these are you know expectations of large groups, of lar hopefully large enough groups, so we can just estimate them from the you know, we can just use the empirical ex um, expectation, estimate them from our label data. And we all nodded along, but actually this is subtle because the group that we're looking at is adaptively chosen. Okay, so we're looking at the data, we're determining our predictor in previous rounds, and that defines for us the group, and now we're trying to measure the expectation of that group. So that's circular, and that can be, that's the question of adaptive, sort of adaptively estimating expectations or adaptive data analysis. And if you don't do anything, if you just sort of look at this and run it, there's no guarantee that for an adaptively chosen group, T sub V, the people who the people within T who got prediction V, there's no guarantee that the empirical expectation and the true expectation are close. So naively, you can just use a fresh sample for each. Actually, I should have said so. We run these iterations until there are no such groups. When there are no such groups, um, kind of by definition, um, we're calibrated and we just return the predictor that we got. To. So naively, in each iteration of these algorithm, you could use a fresh sample. You can use a smaller sample using differential privacy and the connection between differential privacy and adaptive data analysis due to dwarf at all. So, back. Mm -hmm. so is there an assumption here that when you adapt for one group that uh, you aren't screwing up the calibration for other groups? You, you might be. So like you might be, group. you might be. And the question is why does this converge? And I glossed it over. But there's a potential analysis that basically shows that you know we're starting, there's the real P star, we have no idea what it is. We're starting with this P that's totally naive and giving everyone a half. And every time we update, we're getting closer. So there's a potential argument that actually shows that the distance between P and P star is shrinking every time you update. So it might be that you're violating calibration on some other group, I can't guarantee that you're not, but your distance from P star is actually shrinking every time, so this can't happen forever. And after a polynomial number of updates, you will. Yeah, but what, what happens if you don't start from a half, though? Is that still the case? Like if you start from a good predictor? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It seems like it would still be. It is. It does work. Um, this will be. You might have a um, a worse bound, but it will still converge. I mean, it just depends on the distance you start with, right? So every time you're sort of shrinking your distance by some factor of alpha, that depends on alpha. So and globally, and so, you'll hmm? keep converge. Perhaps locally, you could go back to a previous group, but globally, you're saying you're going Globally, to you keep moving in the right direction, exactly. Can, can this be cast as gradient descent on some objective? Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you want to give a longer answer? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to say in a, mo in a since I'm, I'm running out of time, um, I want to say a word about, so this was, this perspective about, ta about protecting all groups that can be identified within a certain class. And the particular instantiation that I talked about was multi-calibration and accuracy protections in work by uh, Stephen and Aaron. Uh, they talked about other notions. Still, you know, this leaves us with a desire. There was the holy grail that I had earlier, this beautiful chalice. Um, to have an all-encompassing or very flexible definition that can handle many concerns. And we have such a definition, the definition of individual fairness uh, from the work of work at all. So I want to end with that and with saying, and kind of with what this multi-group perspective actually tells us about individual fairness. So individual fairness says similar individuals should be treated similarly, where similarity between individuals is measured by a similarity metric. Okay, so x and x prime are delta similar to each other then they should get similar output distributions, maybe similar uh, distributions of, the, of what the predictor assigns to them. So if they're very close in the metric, these distributions should be very close. And if they're far, then there's no constraints. So similar people should be treated similarly. And the beauty of this, uh, of this definition is that you have this metric which can serve as a vehicle for all of your sort of context and all of the societal concerns and all of the subtlety that's inherent in fairness. So this can be very task specific, this metric, and it really gives you a robust and flexible notion of fairness. The question is where does this metric come from? 
So, and that's a good question, and we have such metrics. It's, so first of all, once you specify it, it's open to debate and refinement. We have some examples of this in the real world, but there are challenges with metric fairness. Um, so one challenge is generalization from a training set, if you're trying to do machine learning. And the other is the assumption that the entire metric is known. You need to know this metric in order to guarantee individual fairness. Maybe realistically we can only have a limited sample, and we can use the multigroup perspective that I talked about to relax individual fairness a little bit um, in order to get both generalization and the ability to learn when we only have a limited sample. Um, so I'll just run. And this requires a shout out to Christina's amazing work. So there are related works. I didn't talk about ours, but um, <laughs> two works about learning with an unknown fairness metric and Christina's work that was just mentioned on uh, learning a metric from very limited information about the similarity between individuals. Um, let me gloss over this and just summarize. So as we said, discrimination can be subtle. It's hard to pin down. It's hard to formalize mathematically. Um, the goal is to come up with families of definitions, either parameterized definitions like the individual fairness and the metric-based and the other metric-based definitions, or definitions that are tailored to particular fairness concerns like multi-calibration. And we have this multi-group perspective, which I think is leading us towards an interesting path for doing just that. Um, so I talked about multi-calibration and coming right up, uh, Michael will talk about evidence-based rankings. I'll end here. Thank you. Uh, we're over time now, so we'll just take the questions offline, and we'll see this much advertised talk by Michael.